Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia online. My name is Elizabeth Richard and I'm the daughter of the late Barbara Gone Day in whose memory this endowed lecture has been named. This evening's program is made possible only through support of caring individuals like you. Please consider making a gift of whatever you can and helping the Free Library advance literacy, guide learning and inspire, inspire curiosity for the city of Philadelphia. It is my sincere privilege to interview, introduce Mary Ann Seighart this evening. In her 20 years as a columnist and assistant editor at the Times of London, Mary Ann Seighart won a popular following for her pieces on politics, feminism, economics, and parenthood. Also a frequent broadcaster, she has presented several programs on BBC Radio 4, hosted NewsHour on the BBC World Service as well. Mary Ann, will be the chair of the judges for the 2022 Women's Prize for Fiction. She recently served as visiting professor at King's College London. She's chaired the Social Market Foundation Think Tank and was part of several corporate arts and public policy boards. Her book, The Authority Gap, Why Women Are Still Taken Less Seriously Than Men and What We Can Do About It, uses data, analysis, and interviews with important women leaders thinkers and artists to uncover and fight the unconscious biases that continue systemic sexism. Her talk tonight will be in conversation with award-winning broadcaster and journalist, Tracy Matisak. We are so pleased to have you here with us this evening. Marianne and Tracy, the screen is yours. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Welcome everyone. And thank you so much for being with us at the Free Library for what we hope will be an enlightening conversation uh, please do remember that, as Elizabeth mentioned, we have budgeted some time for your questions toward the end of the program. So you can just click on the icon at the bottom of your screen, uh, enter your question there, and we'll get through as many as we can before we have to say goodbye. All of that said, uh, Marianne Sieghart, welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Thank you so much, Tracy. I wish I could be there in person, but hey, these are COVID days, aren't they? Yes, well, we hope that soon and very soon. <laughs> We'll all be getting together again. Uh, but until then, uh, we want to talk about the authority gap, why women are still taken less seriously than men and what we can do about it. And, and the first question I have for you, Elizabeth, is that you write that the authority gap is the mother of all gender gaps. What do you mean by that? Well, because if we don't take women as seriously as men, we're not going to hire them as ready, readily, promote them as fast, pay them as much their confidence is going to be dented, they're going to feel less entitled to success. So I sort of feel it's at the root of, of, of all the gender gaps. And what it really measures is the extent to which we're more prepared to accord authority to men than to women. And I'm talking about authority both in terms of expertise and also, of course, power and, and leadership. So... <laughs> we sort of assume we, a man knows what he's talking about until he proves otherwise, right? Whereas for a woman, it's just all too often the other way around. And as a result, women are so often underestimated and patronized, interrupted when they talk or talked over. They find it harder to influence a group because people are sort of resistant to being influenced by a woman. And they find their expertise is unfairly challenged. And then also, if they are accorded authority in terms of leadership or power, that often makes people uncomfortable. They don't feel comfortable having a woman having authority over them. So these are the things that I'm investigating in the book. Marianne, how is it that we're still here? In 2022, um, one would think that we've, we've come a long way in so many respects, and yet we're still struggling with this. I, the trouble is that it starts so young and it's very, very ingrained in our, in our brains, in our attitudes, in our perceptions. And so most of us grew up with a father who earned more than our mother, probably worked more than our mother, maybe had more authority at home than our mother. And so we, we, and we've certainly all grown up in a society in which men have basically been in charge. And so we have absorbed this notion, unconsciously, mainly subconsciously, that men have authority over women, or that it's easier to associate male with authority than female with authority. And that then just colors everything we say and everything we do and the way in which we interact with each other. 
It was interesting um, that you wrote in the book that you did a little experiment where you Googled authority and expertise and the results sort of underscored the whole point of the book. They just made my argument for me and I wasn't even looking for this. So I had to give a lecture on this subject at Oxford at the university. And I thought, well, first thing I have to do is define my terms. So I literally just Googled authority definition. Very first result that came up was the Oxford Online Dictionary. And every single example they used of different uses of the word authority began with the same pronoun. I think you can guess which one it was. <laughs> so there was, he had the natural authority of one who is used to being obeyed. He hit the ball with authority. He was an authority on the stock market. And I thought, well, hang on a minute. Didn't Margaret Thatcher have the natural authority of one who was used to being obeyed? Doesn't Serena Williams hit the ball with authority? You know, but it's just the default, isn't it? To associate male with authority. And then when I did the same for actually something similar for expertise, I was looking for a slide to illustrate it. So an illustration of expertise. So I just put expertise in, no, expert into Google image. And in the first 20 images, there wasn't a single woman. Then I saw a woman in a group of men. Then there was Bart Simpson. And finally, there was a proper big photograph of a woman. So I clicked on it and guess what? She was having something explained to her by a male expert. <laughs> <laughs> so there it is. <laughs> so there it is, exactly. Um, you are careful to point out that your book is not a male bashing book, that it's really about tackling the unconscious biases that all of us have. Mm. Uh, women as well as men. And, you know, however intelligent or liberal or even female you are, you probably do harbor this unconscious bias against women in authority. And I do myself, and I've written a whole book about it. So I will sometimes hear perhaps a youngish woman being interviewed on the radio, and maybe she's got quite a high voice and sounds a bit childish in the way that men can't because their voices break. And my first reaction is often, oh, I wonder if she knows what she's talking about. And then I think, no, stop it, for goodness sake. Listen to the content of what she's saying. Don't judge her by the pitch of her voice. But you have to notice, you, you know, when this bias starts manifesting itself, you have to notice and correct for it. So that's the only thing you can do to try and narrow this gap. And Marianne, you yourself have had an illustrious career as a journalist. As Elizabeth mentioned, you've been a senior editor and columnist at the Times, uh, The Independent, The Economist, The Financial Times. You've presented on the BBC. In other words, you have risen to the top of your profession in a male-dominated world. Um, how have you experienced the authority gap? Well, I have been very lucky in that I've been accorded public authority by the Times, the Economist, the FT, the BBC, and that sort of thing really helps, I think. It's mainly when people don't know what I do that it happens, though not always even then. So one example, in fact, it was the opposite. I had been at a conference and that night there was a big dinner and I was sat next to another conference delegate, a man, and he asked me what I did. And I was leading a portfolio life and I genuinely didn't know which of my um, jobs would interest him most. So I said, oh, well, I do a number of things. Uh, I write a political column in The Independent, and I chair a think tank, and I sit on a couple of corporate boards, and um, I'm on the Council of Tate Modern, and I do some charity work. And he said, oh, you're a busy little girl. I was older than the then Prime Minister, but I was a little busy girl. Busy little girl. Busy little yeah. girl. Yeah, there it is. Uh, whoa. Yeah. Uh, and, and another example was actually when someone didn't know what I did, but nonetheless had no such excuse. Um, it was, again, another conference. And I was talking to two fellow delegates, both men. One was the former head of the Foreign Office here. So that's the equivalent of the State Department. And the other was a BBC foreign correspondent. And they knew far more about foreign affairs than I did, I would concede. But I was the expert on British politics there. I'd been writing a column about British politics for 30 years. Another man who knew none of us came up, ignored me completely, looked at the two men and said, can I ask you a question about British politics? Could Tony Blair ever make a comeback? So they looked at me and I answered and I said, no, not a, not a chance. And I explained why about the complexion of the Labour Party. The man could barely bring himself to look at me as I spoke and then asked a follow up question of the two men. And I had to literally touch him on the arm. So he had to turn and look at me and say, look, Actually, I'm the expert on British politics in this group. I'm, I'm a political columnist. I do know what I'm talking about. Yeah. 
<laughs> as part of the research for the book, um, I was fascinated to learn that you interview people who have lived as a man and as a woman, um, and they found it to be such an eye-opening experience, again, underscoring the point of the book. Can you share an example or two of what happened when a woman chose to live as a man and vice versa? This I just found completely fascinating. It's like the most brilliant scientific experiment. Because normally, suppose you're up for promotion and your male colleague is up for the same job and he gets it and you don't. And you may suspect that bias is at play, but it's very hard to prove because you're two different people and maybe he's better than you are. But the experience of trans people is quite different because you're talking about exactly the same person. So they've got the same ability and intelligence and experience and personality and body of work. And the only thing that has changed is their gender. So what you have done is you have controlled for all the other variables, held them constant, as it were, and isolated the only one that matters, which is gender. And what you find is they have utterly different experiences when they are living in a different gender, different sex. So I will give you the example of two science professors from Stanford who each transitioned in opposite directions at the same time. And Ben Barres, who was a neuroscientist, once he started living as a man, he said, I've had the thought a million times, I'm just taken more seriously now. He said, my work is taken more seriously. The same damn work, as he put it, is taken more seriously now that people see me as a man. And someone who didn't know his history was overheard at the back of one of his seminars saying, oh, Ben Barres gave a great seminar today, but then his work's so much better than his sister's, i.e. his own work. <laughs> exact same person. Uh, me, yeah, same person. Meanwhile, Joan Roughgarden, who transitioned, um, she is an evolutionary biologist. Once she started living as a woman, as a when she was living as a man, she said the world was just mapped out for her, the academic world. She was on this sort of conveyor belt to tenure. Every you know, she spoke, people listened. She was on the university senate committee. Basically, life was incredibly easy. Once she started living as a woman, all that fell apart. So she started experiencing all these instances of the authority gap that I write about, such as being patronized, uh, interrupted, contradicted, having her expertise challenged. People would say things to her like, you haven't read the literature. And she said, no one would ever have dared say that to me when I was a man. And she said, to start with, I thought, well, if I'm going to live as a woman, I'm darn well going to be discriminated against like a woman. And then she said, well, the thrill of that's worn off, I can tell you. <laughs> And her conclusion was, a man is assumed to be competent until proven otherwise, and a woman is assumed to be incompetent until she proves otherwise. What's the reaction been like uh, to the book thus far? Have you gotten pushback? Have, have there been um, those who feel that there really is not um, an authority gap? Or, or what's the reaction been like? Well, actually, when I was writing it, and I explained to women what I was writing about, Almost to a woman, they said, yes, this is so important. You know, I've, I've lived this life. I, I've lived this all through my life. I'm so glad you're writing this book. When I told men I was writing the book, about a third of them said, oh, that's interesting, and asked intelligent questions about it, just as you and I would to somebody else writing a book. The other two thirds either just told me my thesis was wrong and it was out of date and I didn't really understand the subject, or mansplained to me, what actually ought to be in the book. And I used to sit there and think, do you not understand the irony that you are displaying the very behavior that I'm writing about? And you're so unself aware, you don't even realize you're doing it. So that was when I was writing it, but actually now it's out. I've been surprised by how little pushback I've had, mainly because I've absolutely packed the book with evidence. I mean, I spent oh, two years uh, in, uh, at Oxford researching this book and I wanted it to be absolutely watertight so that sceptical men couldn't say oh no 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 she doesn't understand what she's talking about I mean I think when they look at the 30 page bibliography they probably think maybe I better not challenge her authority <laughs> I don't know <laughs> on personality tests uh, women tend to score higher on qualities like empathy and emotional intelligence and warmth and men tend to score well on assertiveness and excitement seeking. Um, can you talk about how that tends to play out in the leadership styles 
of men versus women and, and what we as a society tend to value in our leaders? Yeah, that's a very good question. We are socialized, I should say, to be like this. I think a lot of it is socialization. So if you look at children, if you look at boys playing and talking together, a lot of their bonding is actually through a process of competitive boasting. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of, you know, oh, my dad's got a bigger car than yours, or I've scored more goals this season than you have. And so what they're doing is they're sort of, you know, it's, it's not quite like stags at bay, but you know, the, they are competing with each other to be more assertive, to be more successful. They're training themselves up for that sort of behavior in adult life. With girls, it's exactly the other way around. So girls have to be self-deprecating and modest in order to be accepted both by adults, you know, you'll be told by your parents oh, nobody likes a boastful girl, but also by their peers. So if you see girls bonding together, they will bond by saying, oh, I'm useless at math, or I hate my hair, or my legs are too short, or something like that. And that's how they get accepted by the other girls. And that continues into adulthood too. So to bond as a woman, you admit vulnerability. To bond as a man, you would go nowhere near admitting vulnerability. It's quite the opposite. You're sort of asserting yourself. Um, when we break those stereotypes and we go against them, people really don't like it. So in order to be taken seriously and to get on at work, you have to be confident, you have to be assertive, you have to show leadership skills. And these are all character traits that are associated with being male. And when women show them, we recoil quite often and we feel quite uncomfortable and we don't like it. And we start using adjectives about her such as, oh, she's quite abrasive, she's strident, she's aggressive. She's bossy, she's overbearing. They might use the B word about her. Um, I mean, after all, if a, if, if a male leader is tough, we admire him for it. If a woman leader is tough, we dislike her for it. That's really what it comes down to. And so it's very difficult as a woman to get this right because if you're not confident enough, you're disrespected. And if you are confident enough, you're often disliked. And therefore, we have to navigate this very narrow path when it comes to confidence. It's not enough just to say to women, oh, you should just lean in or you should go on an assertiveness training course because it doesn't help. So uh, we, 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 we have to overlay an enormous amount of warmth onto our confidence and assertiveness in order not to be disliked. And you might say, well, we should just grow a thicker skin and who cares if we're disliked? Well, it actually really matters for us in career terms as well, because all the evidence shows that when it comes to hiring and promotion, for women, likability is a really important characteristic, much more than it is for men. So it's we can't just sort of say, oh, I don't care what people think of me, um, because you won't get anywhere. So the burden really is on the woman, right, to sort of temper um, her authority with warmth, um, you know, with other qualities that will make her more palatable, if you will. Exactly. And, you know, I wish the world weren't the way it is. Uh, when I'm giving advice to young women and I say this, I think my heart breaks and I think I want to be able to say to you, just be yourself, just be authentic. But sadly, the world being the way it is at the moment, I mean, maybe in a generation or two's time, it'll be different. But the world being the way it is at the moment, yes, we have to smile more. We have to temper our authority with humor. We have to read the room very carefully. We have to make sure we're not, you know, trampling on men's egos. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's, and, you know, it's exhausting as well, isn't it? You mentioned we, we've been talking about women leaders, and it made me think of the moment in the 2020 um, U.S. vice presidential debate in which then candidate Kamala Harris uh, famously said to Mike, Pez Mike Pence, uh, excuse me, Mr. Vice President, I'm speaking. Um, that, yeah. of course, became a meme. She said it four times, I think, during the debate. It became a meme, a T-shirt, a mug. Um, there was all sorts of merchandise around that, but it also became a rallying cry for so many women who have been spoken over, interrupted, you might call it manterrupted, um, in, in the course of, of their work. Um, talk about why that still happens so much. And, and again, what it tells us about the way we view women, because you devoted um, much of a chapter to that subject alone. 
Yes, because interruption is probably the most annoying of all this authority gap behavior, because not only does it suggest that the man, it usually is a man, uh, that the man thinks that what he has to say is more important than what you have to say, but it is literally silencing you. And it happens much more to women than it does to men, more often by men. Women interrupt too, but they tend to do so in an affirming way. So they might sort of say, oh, yes, yes, I agree. In other words, actually amplifying what the woman is saying and allowing her to continue. When men do it to women, it's much more often negative and trying to cut her off. And this happens even at the most senior levels. So you're not insulated from the authority gap, even when you are incredibly authoritative yourself. So there was a very striking study done of US Supreme Court proceedings quite recently, only a few years ago. And you don't get more authoritative than being a US Supreme Court justice. And it found that although women make up only a third of the justices, they suffered two thirds of all interruptions. In other words, they were four times more likely to be interrupted than their male colleagues, 96% of the time by men. Mm. And why does it happen? Well, it starts very early. So parents are more likely to interrupt their daughters than their sons. Little boys are more likely to interrupt little girls than other boys. And what happens is the way girls and boys are brought up, boys are almost taught to believe that they are entitled to more conversational space than girls are. So in classrooms, uh, teachers are between eight and nine times more likely to call on boys to answer questions than girls. I mean, it's really striking, the imbalance, and to call boys to the front of the class more. Now, sometimes it's a way of achieving discipline in the classroom if a boy's acting up. You can call him back by you know, trying to get him to answer a question. But nonetheless, boys get much more attention in class. So girls are rewarded for being quiet and well-behaved. Boys are rewarded for speaking up. And so boys learn the sense of entitlement to disproportionate speaking time, which they then exercise as adults. Um, one of my favorite studies, because it makes me laugh, was um, men and women were given two paintings by Albrecht Dürer to look at. And they were asked to talk about them for as long as they liked into a tape recorder. And the women talked on average for 3.17 minutes. The men talked on average for 13 minutes, in other words, four times as long. But even this wasn't accurate because three of the men were still talking when their 30 minute cassette tapes <laughs> ran out. <laughs> but it does really underscore the point that so much of this is just the way that we are socialized. Um, it starts so early in life and it's just carried generationally. And this is how we end up where we are. Um, you write that for women of color, that there is often the double whammy of sexism as well as racism, and you illustrate it with a story about what happened to Dawn Butler, a Black MP, um, when she first entered the House of Commons. Really telling example. This was a horrible story. Yeah, so she was a Labour MP, newly elected. She walked into a lift to go up to her office, and there was a white male MP there, and he looked at her and he said, this lift really isn't for cleaners. I mean, can you imagine even, I mean, it's bad enough to think that, but actually to say it yeah. to someone, what sort of white male superiority was going through his head? I just yeah. beg his belief, doesn't it? I also, I remember talking to Bernadine Evaristo, who is the most fabulous um, novelist. She, she won the Booker Prize together with Margaret Atwood uh, and she's black and she is now in her sixties, but when she was in her fifties, she's also a professor of creative writing. And she was giving a tutorial to a young 21 year old white female student. And they decided to do it in the cafe. And the waitress came up to take their order. And she asked the young white girl both for the order and gave her the bill. And Bernadine was in her fifties, but she was black. Yeah. So, and what you find is that all these instances of authority gap behavior, such as um, having to prove more evidence of your competence or people being surprised at your abilities, these are bigger still for women of color than for white women. I mean, white women are twice as likely to say that as, as white men, but black women are even more likely to say it. Yeah, and then of course you have the problem that even if you, you know, supposedly, suppose you as a black woman, you are extremely competent, you're completely brilliant and you get hired for this very good job, people will say, oh, she was just a diversity hire however good you are so you have that extra stigma it's you know women get that too sort of oh she was hard because she was a woman but if you're a black woman of course you get it doubly so 
Yeah. And yet on the flip side of that, Marianne, there is um, some research that suggests that overall, that Black women can face fewer challenges than white women when it comes to leadership, if, assuming they make it to the level of leadership, um, but only because of stereotypes about Black yeah. women. How does that work? That was really interesting, actually. I mean, some things do go in the opposite direction. And this is because Black women are already assumed to be very sort of confident and assertive and feisty, they can get away with what I was talking about earlier. You know, they can get away with being confident and assertive more sort of more easily than white women can and a lot more easily than Asian women can because of that stereotype. And therefore, they're less likely to be disliked for it. I think it's important too to, to talk about um, what you describe as internalized misogyny, and you you devote a good portion of the book to this as well. That is the idea of women being biased against other women, and we can get into the queen bee syndrome and all of that. But where does that come from? Well, it comes from us all growing up in the same world. You know, as I said earlier, we've all grown up, well, most of us have grown up with our father sort of being more in charge. And we've all grown up in a world in which men have basically been in charge. I mean, even now, um, you know, in, in your Congress, there are three men for every woman, both in the House and the Senate. You haven't had a female president. Um, and, you know, it's and in the Fortune um, 500, I think something like 8% of CEOs are female. That means 92% are men. Um, and uh, and therefore that sort of creates the biases in our brains and they are just as strong I'm afraid in women as in men the unconscious bias at least um, so there's a thing called the implicit association test which Harvard some Harvard psychologists have devised and uh, it has its critics actually for all sorts of reasons but it does just measure how quickly and accurately you can associate female nouns with sort of work and career nouns and male nouns with home and uh, family nouns. And it's just much quicker and more accurate to do it that way around than the other way around, just because our brains are more used to it. And women show just as much bias in these tests as men do. A little anecdote, I, was, I made a BBC radio programme about women's bias against women. And I asked the listeners to imagine a hijacker breaking into the cockpit of a plane and attacking the pilot. And then I said, now, how are you picturing the pilot? I bet he's a middle-aged white man. And a woman called Margaret Oates tweeted. She said, I was driving back from work in uniform, listening to this radio program. And yes, I imagined a middle-aged white man, despite being a female pilot. So that just shows how ingrained it is. <laughs> so there it is. Yeah. Um, I mentioned the Queen Bee syndrome just a moment ago. Um, can you describe what that is and and whether it's sort of a, a is it a misguided coping mechanism what is that all about yeah the queen bee syndrome describes those women and they are fewer and fewer as time goes on i'm i'm i'm, I'm glad to say but those women who once they get a foot on the ladder don't want to help any other women up or indeed might quite want to push them down so they maintain their position of power and it happened a lot more i think in the generation above me so for instance margaret thatcher you know, became Britain's first prime minister, female prime minister. And she was prime minister for 11 years and surrounded herself with men. So she appointed one woman to her cabinet in that time who only lasted about six months. That's classic Queen Bee behavior. But it was more understandable in that generation when women were there, it was usually only one woman and she was really there on sufferance. And she had to keep proving to the men that she was just as masculine as they were, just as tough as they were. She wasn't gonna make any allowances for other women. And if she did, that might seem nepotistic to the men. So, you know, they had, these sole women had a lot to prove. And that quite often they felt there is only room for one woman here. So if another woman's on her way up, she's threatening my position because she'll take it rather than there being room for two, which is not what, I mean, men never experienced that. Yeah. Um, and there are still some queen bees who act like that. But there was one interesting study done um, of companies with female CEOs. And if they were queen bees, you wouldn't expect there to be other women in senior positions around them. Actually, it found that they were twice as likely to have CFOs, you know, chief financial officers who were female as in companies run by men. So that suggests that these days women are, are less queen bee-ish than they might have been in the past. They're more likely to bring other women on with them. 
I do seem to remember a conversation between uh, Maggie Thatcher and the Queen in The Crown about that very subject, about um, her explaining why, Maggie Thatcher explaining why she did not have a lot of women around her, which was fascinating in itself. Um, no, you Mary don't want to believe the crown it is absolutely, the crown yes. is <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, beyond a mere resentment or a sense of skepticism maybe um, about women in positions of authority, there is also well-documented hateful resistance um, to those who either call out inequalities um, or just command the respect that they're due. And you wrote at length about that as well in the book. And I was thinking about Dr. Jill Biden and the pushback um, from one individual in particular who wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal saying, you know, Jill, kiddo, um, drop yeah, the doctor yeah. title. You're not a physician. This is, you know, laughable. Um, how do we begin to combat those kinds of attitudes and the resentment toward women who uh, claim their authority um, or call out inequities? Yeah, it is really difficult, this. I mean, women online suffer 27 times more abuse than men. 27 times, get your head around that. And this was actually proved in an academic study where they, they put names into an internet forum and, uh, and saying exactly the same thing. And when this name, when, when this sort of made up person had a female name, she was abused 27 times more than when it had a male name. Uh, and, you know, we're used to women in the public eye being abused. I mean, you know, the kiddo thing was horrible and it was patronizing, but not as sick as a lot of the abuse that certainly British parliamentarian, female parliamentarians get. And I expect probably in the US too. Um, particularly on Twitter, I mean, rape threats, death threats, things that I wouldn't be allowed to say on screen. I've actually printed a page of them in my book just because I thought people needed to understand how serious these threats are I and mean, how disgusting they are, because otherwise people do sometimes say, oh, well, she should just grow thicker skin. Once you see what gets said to these women, you know, you might take that back. But it's not just women in the public eye. So what I found really distressing was that you can even have a, you know, a 13 year old girl putting a video up on YouTube about braiding her hair and she'll get a rape threat in the comments section. I mean, how sick do you have to be to do this? And what's interesting is a lot of these threats are to do with physically silencing women. It's about cutting their heads off, cutting their tongues out, doing unmentionable things in their mouth. Um, but it's basically trying to impose a tax on our speaking in the public sphere. Yeah. And yet um, through all of this, I'm sorry, Mary, go ahead. No, 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 no. I, I, I was just going to say that, um, and yet through all of this, you remain optimistic that we can in fact narrow the authority gap. In fact, you say that it can be done, um, or at least we can progress in one generation. Um, first, my first question is what makes you optimistic? Uh, that we can, in fact, narrow the authority gap? Well, because there are so many small things we can do, which would make it so much narrower, um, partly bring our, the next generation of children up differently, but even just the way we interact with each other. And you see, I think that although we were talking just now about the backlash against authoritative women, I think that's from quite a minority of men. I mean, I think, okay, so I would roughly divide men into three. There's about a third of men who completely understand this already and treat us with utterly equal respect, listen to us just as attentively as they do to other men, read our books. I love men like that. We all do. We notice it straight away, don't we? They are fantastic. They're our heroes. At the other end of the spectrum are the complete dinosaurs, and I fear a few sickos as well, who deeply resent women's authority, deeply resent women doing better than them, and are overtly sexist. They're not going to read my book and there's not much I can do about them. But I do think there's about a third of men in the middle who are not maligned towards us at all and don't realize what they're doing is sometimes silencing us. They don't notice that they um, listen to women less than to men, or if they walk up to a man and a woman standing together, they automatically address the man first, or they interrupt women in meetings. You know, they're not doing it malignly, it's just habit, it's ingrained. And actually, they're probably quite like to change if only it were pointed out to them. And so my view is that if we can put together the third of men who are fantastic and the third of men in the middle who are willing to change, then 
the real sexists start getting really marginalized. Mm. And I think it's a bit like racism 10 or 20 years ago, when in a group of white people, someone might make a casually racist joke and will get away with it. Now they don't, thank goodness. And I sort of hope that in 10 or 20 years time, or if people read this book, or if people start talking about this a lot more and becoming more aware, it will become increasingly unacceptable to be at least overtly sexist. And I think those men will start to feel quite marginalized. Before we go to our audience questions, Marianne, what are a couple of suggestions for people who are listening, um, who are in the process of reading your book, who are just concerned and would like to see the authority gap narrowed? Um, give us some suggestions about how that might happen. Well, in my last chapter, I have 140 suggestions. I counted the other day, so far <laughs> too many to list now. Um, but the reason there are so many is that every instance of the authority gap might seem small at the time, I and mean, it's irritating, but you know, somebody interrupts you at a meeting. It's annoying, but it's small. But they, they roll up like compound interest over the course of a lifetime to create this really vast gap between the opportunities and achievements of women and men. And so it requires lots of small solutions in order to narrow the gap. And it may be things like a man who's used to talking too much, just reining himself back a bit, not interrupting women, um, uh, starting to read books by women instead of only or mainly books by men, those sorts of things. Obviously we can bring up our children in a, in a, in a much more equal way. Um, but I think that, a, the most critical thing is to accept that we all suffer from this unconscious bias and we can't put a lid on it and we don't need to feel ashamed of it, but we can do something about the way it manifests itself and try and correct for it. Yeah. And I think it's probably if I had to, right? yeah, it's about awareness. And I think if I had to choose just one other, because I know I'm not you, you don't want 140. Um, I would say, particularly when it comes to work um, surroundings, don't mistake confidence for competence because they're absolutely not the same thing. And I think that's one very big reason why men get hired faster, promoted faster, paid more, because they are quite often overconfident and people take them at their word. And so if a man tells everybody how great he is, he's more likely to get promoted. It's not just that women don't tell everyone how great they are, they're not even allowed to because people don't like self-promoting women, just like they don't like assertive women. And so women tend to be self-deprecating or just accurate about their ability. And if you take these two people at their word, you're going to hire the overconfident, but probably not as competent man over the self-deprecating, but probably super competent woman. Well, on that note, let's go to some questions from our audience. Uh, you mentioned raising our children just a moment ago and Bonnie asks, how do we raise our children to not develop this bias in the first place? Okay, first thing you must do is make sure if you're in a straight relationship that the mother and the father have equal authority at home in front of the children. And so that the father respects what the mother says just as much as she respects what he says. Ideally, if she wants her career to be as important as his, he allows it to be. I hate this sense of allowing it, but you know what I mean. Um, and uh, don't allow your son, if you've got one, to interrupt your daughter. Make sure that she uh, has as much sort of say in family discussions as he does. Don't push them into gender sort of stereotypical chores or activities. You know, encourage her to climb trees, tinker with the car engine with her dad if, he, if, he, if she wants to, encourage him to learn to cook. Um, I interviewed a lot of very successful and powerful women for this book, and I asked them all about their childhoods because I was interested to see if there was a common thread. And the one thing they almost all said to a woman was, my father really believed in me. And I thought that was fascinating because it wasn't just my parents, but specifically my father. And often my father took me off to do things with him. And it was as if they somehow were given permission in a man's world to succeed. I thought that was very interesting. Yeah. Um, question from Abby says, what role does do class and socioeconomic status play uh, in the authority gap? Well, it was interesting because you talked about the role of color. And when I, I wrote about intersectionality and I also talked about class and disability and sexuality. And yeah, class widens, sorry, being working class widens the authority gap compared with being middle class. You could probably write this sort of book about class, in fact, though class is easier to disguise than gender, 
So, I mean, certainly, I think it's probably slightly less the case in the US, but in the UK, your class is very much given away by your accent, by how you speak. But a lot of people who are born working class develop accents that make them sound middle class. So it's easier to pass, as it were, or indeed you become middle class maybe by going to college and, and getting a professional job. Uh, Gerald asks, were there any statistics that you found counterintuitive in your research? Hmm. Yes, I think one thing, well, one of the things we've already talked about was black women being allowed to be more assertive and confident. I thought that was interesting. Another one was about lesbians. And I thought that um, that being LGBTQ would actually hold women back um, even more than being straight. But actually, it looks like that's not the case. And it may be because people perceive them as being sort of almost halfway towards men. Mm -hmm. And therefore, actually, lesbians, again, can get away with being more assertive and confident without being disliked. And also, when a study was done asking about how committed straight, it was a sort of particular straight woman candidate and a lesbian woman, how committed they would be to their career after they had a baby, people assumed that the lesbian would be more committed to her career than the straight woman. Interesting. So that was interesting. Yeah. Uh, Tammy says, my goodness, I don't want to seem naive, but do you see the tables tipping among the younger generations uh, toward women's empowerment? I wish I could say this. I, I wish I could say yes, um, with sort of more alacrity. I was really expecting, sorry, actually, this is a good, good answer to the previous question too. I was really expecting the young to be much less sexist than the old. Mm -hmm. And I discovered this isn't always the case. So in the implicit association test, when associating female words with career words, uh, the young were actually more biased than the old, bizarrely. There's another thing which studies, um, and this is an international study of how suited people believe women are for leadership, for political leadership. Young men say less suited than older men. And then there were other studies. There was one study asking biology students who was the smartest and best informed in their class. And they asked this question all the way through the year. And the young women were very accurate in their assessment of who the smartest and best informed were. The young men, and these were guys of 19, 20, 21, almost always chose other men and not women. And this disparity actually widened during the course of the year, even as the women were showing their expertise during the year, the guys were still going for other guys. And I thought, how weird this is, because their antennae are so attuned to racism, to transphobia, to homophobia. You'd think they'd be just as sensitive to sexism, but it seems not. Yeah, it, it may, makes me think too about a statistic that I read, and maybe it was in your book or elsewhere, but um, about the STEM professions, just thinking about education and how something like 28% of the STEM workforce is female. And, and we all know that traditionally, um, there is a lack of women entering those fields or, or majoring in those subjects. Can you talk a little bit about that, about why we see um, way fewer women entering that world and, and what it's like for them in that world? Hmm. I mean, in, interestingly, a, a very good study was done asking young women, American women, why they didn't choose to major in computer studies at college. And by far the biggest answer was not, it's too difficult, or I'm not interested in it, or I don't like math or whatever. It was because they perceived there was so much gender bias in that subject. And they're actually right. So the few women who do decide to do computer studies in general have a pretty difficult time, particularly in the colleges where it's very much majority male. And the young men just assume they don't understand it. They, you know, they do all the things that I complain about, multiple times um, and and the same happens actually in tech companies afterwards you know if the if these young women do choose to major in computer studies if they do carry on in tech afterwards there's a real sort of bro chauvin techno chauvinism uh, in those fields that makes it very difficult for women um, so I, I really admire the pioneers who do it and of course the more who do it the easier I think it will eventually get but whether you're a you know a techie or an engineer uh, or a scientist, it's, or at least a physicist in particular, I think it's not so bad in biology and chemistry. Um, it's pretty hard being a woman. Mm 
Kate asks, uh, can you touch on the effect of race in this disparity in authority when it comes to non-white men and women of any race? I'm sorry, you broke up there. When it comes okay. to? To non-white men and women of any race. So we're taking white okay. men out of the equation and talking about men of color uh, and women of any race. Is there, um, you know, what does the research say about that? Or is that something that you explored in your work? I did, the, the, the study I was citing earlier doesn't disaggregate the men by race. So it only looks at men in general compared with women of different races. So I can't give you an answer to that, I'm sorry to say. I would imagine that men of color suffer some authority gap, certainly more than white men do, is my guess. I don't suppose it's as big as women in general, but uh, I'm, I'm only guessing there. Yeah. Um, Bonnie asks, do you see any examples in movies or TV shows that provide a narrowing of this gender gap? Oh yes, and I'm so happy this is happening at last. I mean, it's very, very recent. I'd say it's only in the last, what, two or three years uh, that movies and indeed TV series have started to feature really interesting women who show agency and interesting characters and are not just the love, you know, the sex object or the help meet or the murder victim, which is basically what we, what we used to be. And I am just loving this. And I think it will make an enormous difference. What we see on the screen makes such a difference to how we think the world is around us. I'll just give you one example, which I found so striking, which was um, some academic researchers interviewed women in STEM who were of an age to have watched the X-Files when they were children. And of course, the X-Files had this fantastic character called Scully, played by Gillian Anderson, who is this really capable, funny, clever female scientist. 63% of those women in STEM said they had been motivated to go into a STEM field because of watching the X-Files. And I thought if one TV program can change so many women's lives, you know, how much, di how much different would the world be if our TV and TV programs and movies actually reflected, reflected the world the way it is? and not the way they used to. So I think that is gonna help a lot. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I mean, we still have about 90% of, of movies are directed by men, by the way, <laughs> there's still a long way to go, but yeah. we're getting there. Marietta says, thank you for the opportunity to think this through. My two grandsons wrestle, push, kind of bully each other, but nothing violent. Whereas my two granddaughters, their sisters are passive observers and shrug their shoulders when their brothers behave quote, like boys. Question is, is there anything rooted in biology that boys need to do this over the top physical behavior uh, to cultivate competitiveness? Well, boys do have a bit more testosterone than girls um, when they're young, but prepubescent boys, which I think probably explains why they are a bit more physical and they need to run around more and they fight a bit more. But I think much more is socialized and conditioned than we think. So for instance, competitiveness, which she mentions, if men were just naturally, physically more competitive than women, then it would be the same in all societies at all times in all ages, because it would just be part of our body, right, because of our hormones. But in fact, there are matriarchal societies in which the women are more competitive than the men. So there was a study done of the Kazi society, which is matriarchal in India, comparing it with the Maasai, which is patriarchal in Tanzania. And they found that not only were the Kazi women more competitive than the Kazi men, but they were more competitive even than the Maasai men. <laughs> so, so I think actually, you know, a little bit is biologically determined. I would say the vast majority is socially conditioned. Yeah. Uh, Karen asks, have the demographics at your presentations suggested that men are listening to your ideas and arguments? I wish this were more the case. Um, I went to give a talk at a big investment bank uh, recently and their employees are 75% male, 25% female. The invitation was issued to everybody, but the audience was 75% female and 25% male. And so after that, I said to my speaker's agent, I'd like you to negotiate next time I give one of these talks, tell the organizers, so name a fee that is um, a bit more than I normally ask, and then tell them they can have the appropriate discount if they guarantee that men will make up between 40 and 60% of the audience. Wow. 
because we're only going to change the world. I mean, of course, you know, it's fascinating for women to hear this. It confirms what they already know. It gives them ammunition, I think, and it makes them understand that a lot of this is not personal. The behavior they come up against is not personal, it's systemic. But I don't think the world's going to change unless men listen to it too. And so I was really determined that men would read this book. I really hope they do. I had long arguments with my publisher about whether to call myself M.A. Seacart on the cover rather than Marianne, because men read four books by a man on average for every one by a woman, whereas we read roughly 50-50. And I said to the, I said to the publisher, I need the, the, the cover design has to be something that a man won't feel embarrassed to be seen reading on the subway. And then I thought how tragic that he even would, because I wouldn't feel at all embarrassed to be seen reading a book by a man. But this is part of the problem, isn't it? Well, and it speaks to what you said about the onus being on women to make things more palatable and, you know, the design of the book or even, you know, using your initials um, and thinking about so many female authors from generations past who had to use a male name um, in order to have their books read. Or even now with J.K. Rowling. There it is. Or yeah. indeed, I use the example in my book of a woman called Serena Mackesy, who struggled to get her books read, reviewed and sold under her name, decided to change it to Alex Marwood, which was, you know, androgynous. And she's never looked back. She won a huge award in the first year. Stephen King said it was one of his best 10 books of the year. <laughs> exactly the same woman. Wow. Wow. Well, on that note, um, we will begin to wrap up our conversation. But before we do, I just want to read a comment from Eric, who says, thank you for addressing how these issues are pervasive in the LGBTQ plus population as well. Um, many thanks here from our audience. Uh, Marianne Sieghart, it has been a delight talking with you. Thank you so much for writing this book and really challenging all of us, men and women, to Think about the way that we think about the role of women in our society. This was um, is such a necessary book and, uh, and a great way to raise awareness. So thank you so much for the work you've done on this. Oh, well, thank you, Tracy. It's been a real delight talking to you. What a professional interviewer you are. <laughs> well, thank you. Again, the book is called The Authority Gap, Why Women Are Still Taken Less Seriously Than Men and What We Can Do About It. We've got a link where you can purchase the book from Uncle Bobby's Bookstore here in Philadelphia. I want to say a special thank you to Elizabeth Richard for introducing us this evening. And as always, thanks to Andy, Laura, and Jason, the author events team at the Free Library of Philadelphia for bringing all of us together. Thanks to all of you for making time to join us this evening. Uh, stay safe and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you very much.